Good morning, Eagle Heights Cathedral, and welcome to today's Sunday celebration service. Even in the midst of a pandemic, we have come to find that our God is faithful and true, as he proves time and time again that he truly is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. As we enter into this season of gratitude and thanksgiving, we invite you to extend yourselves to be his hands and feet by giving into the hands full of rice, which allows us to provide meals for thanksgiving for families in need. Now join us today as we hear a new message from Bishop James E. Collins. Hallelujah. All over this room, stand to your feet. Come on, if he's been good to you, why don't you put your hands together? If he's been faithful to you, come on, give God some praise. Hallelujah. Father, thank you so much, Lord, that you love us. Lord, that you're good to us and that you're faithful to us. Lord, I pray today, God, that you would speak directly into our hearts. And Lord, that your word will cause transformation. And Lord, that when we walk out of this place, that we would not leave the same way that we came in. Father, we give you glory for who you are and what you're about to do in this room. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's children said, amen. Amen. Praise him. We love you, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Three in one. Holy Spirit, manifest the Father to us. Manifest the Son in his fullness. Manifest yourself among us. Change us. Move us. Mature us. Take us from glory to glory. We surrender now. Our minds, our soul, in the name of Jesus, and it is done. Amen and amen. Yes, give God glory. Hallelujah. John 15, 26 through 27, and then John 16, 12 through 16. As we continue to talk about being truly led by the Spirit, we're going to begin talking about the properties of the Holy Spirit. John 15, 26 through 27. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you will also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. John 16, 12 through 16. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come, he will glorify me. For he will take of mine and declare it to you a little while, and you will not see me. And again a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. In the beginning of this series, we set out on a journey, and we are still out on that journey. And that journey is found in Galatians 5, 16 through 18, where the Apostle Paul says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things you wish. But if you are led of the Spirit, you are not under law. You see, the journey we are on is exactly that. We are on a journey of learning how to live day by day under the influence more and more of the Spirit and less so by the soul man. And as I move on in this teaching, I must bring you back from time to time to remind you that your real problem is not your flesh. It is that little thing that stands in between the spirit and the flesh called the soul man. I remind you again today that the soul man can be cocky, arrogant, selfish, a know-it-all, a dictator, two-faced, manipulative. Most of all, he can be full of emotion and thus he can be a host of devious things. I also remind you today that he is also very wonderful when he is led by the Holy Spirit. For again, it is the seat of our emotions, our physical feelings, and most importantly, he is the place of our natural decision maker. He gives us our personality, our self-awareness, our rationality, and natural feeling. And church, believe me, all of those things that we have, we need. They are gifts from God that allow us to live and enjoy a full life. But here is the problem. When the soul man is in control, his greatest danger in your life and in my life is his incredible inability to miscalculate the issues of life. 
And many of those miscalculations have the power to ruin a man or a woman's life and destiny. And Paul said the assurance of that not happening is to be led by the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. I need to emphasize some things again that you need to understand that every desire of your flesh is not evil within itself. The question many times becomes, in this situation, is what I desire, it what, is what seems to be good to me, is it going to be good for me? Let me illustrate it this way. Marriage is a desire that is a beautiful thing, but here is the question. Are you going to get married so that you can marry anyone, so that you can be without someone? And here's the problem. I know someone who is on their sixth marriage. Now, let me talk to you for a minute. That's a desire of the flesh that is not wrong, but it became a problem because it is not being led of the spirit. Listen now, the deal with the soul man is that it seeks to see how can I get closer to God while still holding on to many of the desires of my flesh. And Jesus foretold us that he would send us a helper, someone to live on the inside of us, that when he comes, listen now, he will lead and guide us into all truth. Now watch, when he comes, that is important. The most important part is that he will lead and guide us. And I repeat, the most important relationship you will ever have as a Christian is with the Holy Spirit. Let me give you a little bit more definition concerning the Holy Spirit. Number one, I want to remind you again that he is a person. And the Bible refers to him in the masculine gender. Let me talk to you for a minute, church. There is no such thing as Mother Nature. There is only Father God, and he is totally and completely masculine. He is not an invisible force of God, nor is he one of several gods. Neither is he a God who once was a man. The Bible is clear, and the Bible says that he has intellect, he has emotion, and he has will. Let's talk about his intellect. 1 Corinthians 2 and 11 says, For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit has intellect. He Secondly, he has emotion. Ephesians 4 and 30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The word grieve literally means a deep and poignant distress, a cause of suffering, life's joys and griefs. And Paul says to all of us, please, please make it a point in your life to not live your Christian life in a way that breaks the Holy Spirit's heart. And then he lists some of the things that will break his heart that will grieve the spirit. In verse 31 of Ephesians 4, he says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Now let me say something. That list is not an exhaustive, exhaustive list. Those are illustrations that Paul is speaking of. But here you need to understand that anything, not just sin, but anything that is not the perfect will of God for your life, when you willingly step out of that and accept something that is not his perfect will, it grieves the Holy Spirit of God. Number two, the Holy Spirit is God. He is the third person of the Trinity who fully is equally and eternally shares in one common nature with the Father and the Son. Yet with all of that, he is represented in Scripture as a distinct person. He is called God by the Apostle Peter, and he displays the characteristics of God. What are those characteristics? He is all-wise, all-powerful, all-knowing, eternal, and holy. Now, in the Bible, in the book of Acts chapter 5, I believe it is, yes, there was a couple who was named Ananias and Sapphira. They sold a possession, a piece of land, and then they kept back some of the proceeds. And the Bible says that they sold it for X amount of dollars. They made God a promise that they would bring all of that to the church. But when they get to the church, they say to Peter, we need you to understand that we only got X amount of dollars for it. In Acts 5, 3 through 4, listen to what it says. 
But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Now, I want you to hear what Peter is saying. Peter is saying, if you were stingy, and you decided that you didn't want to give God what you promised, why did you have to lie about it? Why couldn't you simply just say, I have changed my mind, my flesh what, what it wants, and my soul man is going to make sure that my flesh gets what it wants. I'm not giving this money to God. No, he had to lie and try to hide the reality of his heart, and the Holy Spirit revealed it to the preacher. That's why I tell people all the time, sometimes people come in my office and they lie like a rug. And I just sit there, and I'm not saying it out loud, but I'm saying to myself, liar, liar, pants on fire. I go to my wife's office, and I say, baby, they think they got over on me. They lied like a rug. Let me tell you why. It's not because I know everything, but the Holy Spirit knows everything. He is all wise. He is all powerful. He is all knowing. He is eternal, and he is holy. Number three, he does the works of God. The Holy Spirit does the works of God. He was involved in creation. Genesis 1, 1 through 2 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit was hovering over the face of the waters. He is God. He is intimately interacting in our lives. Let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit intimately reacts and interacts in the lives of people who are not yet Christians. Here's a prime example of it. When I met Lady Brenda, she sat with me for two to three hours outside her dorm, and she started listening to me talk about God. Her response was, I don't know why I'm listening to you. Most of the time when people talk to me about God, I cuss them out. But she said, there's something about you I wanted to listen. What she was listening to was, though it was my voice, it was the Holy Spirit that was beckoning to her. And when the Holy Spirit beckoned, she went out and she gave her heart to Jesus without a man being there. Because we need to understand the Holy Spirit is even moving on the hearts and the lives of people who don't yet know him. They just haven't figured it out yet. And again, there is no other relationship greater of import to you and your Christian life than your relationship with the Holy Spirit of the living God. Now, we are on a quest to know him intimately. Most of us do not know him as such. Let me tell you what this present day generation is like. Most of today's church is like that group that Apollos and Paul, they ran into a generation in the book of Ephesus. And they asked them a question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And listen to the response. They said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is any Holy Spirit. Such is the case of much of the body of Christ today. Most of the modern day church has not heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And that is because, again, we who bear the sword of the Spirit, the word of God in the pulpit, we have failed to teach you who he is, what he wants to do, and what he is able to do when we yield our lives completely to the Holy Spirit. Now, everybody look at me. You need to understand something that the God does not, that God does not treat us special because we stand in the pulpit with his Holy Spirit. What God does through my spirit, he wants to do through your spirit. And you need to get an expectation of that. And so we have not taught you for three main reasons. First of all, I'm going to say it again till we get it. The church of Jesus Christ, we have got stopped to stop wanting to and being more concerned about feeling good than doing good and being good. We got to stop it. Number two, there are those who simply do not believe in his existence. And thirdly, we don't teach you because we who believe in his existence, we are afraid because if we teach you about him, we eventually have to release him. If we teach him, we must release him. And if we release him, our fear is that some of y'all going to go cuckoo. And some have. 
But let me help you. Some of us preachers have gone cuckoo. So many teachers and preachers, we have turned the moving of the Holy Spirit into a three-ring circus, and we've used his name, and we have declared that God told me in order to manipulate people and build our own financial empires. But I am telling you that in spite of all of that, I want you to learn to, to know who the Holy Spirit is because it is the deepest relationship that you can ever have. When you begin to walk with him and talk with him and hear from him, there is no greater relationship. And the reason we abuse is because we don't understand the purpose. The driving purpose of the Holy Spirit, I told you last week, number one is to bring Jesus Christ down from heaven to us. Secondly, to confirm to the believer that he is a child of God. Now, let me give you a third reason and purpose of the Holy Spirit. A third driving purpose of the Holy Spirit is to bring everything in heaven into the earth. That powerful prayer lesson that Jesus taught his disciples, Matthew 6, 9 through 10. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Jesus said every day of your waking, breathing, living life, pray for the Father's kingdom to come and his will to be done in the earth. In other words, whatever is in heaven, pray that it will also be manifest in the earth. What Whatever there is in heaven, pray that it will be manifest in your lives. What we're talking about here is for God's favor to be manifest in the life of the child of God. Now, the word kingdom is the Greek word basilia. It means God's rule within believers' hearts while here on earth. God's rule within believers' hearts while here on earth. In Revelation 1.18, Jesus said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Now, Jesus said in Matthew 16 and 19, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now don't miss this, church. Don't miss this. Jesus took the keys of death and hell out of the devil's hand, meaning that through him we can be free from Satan's authority, reconciled to God, and live victoriously under God's authority. Therefore, thereby, we don't don't have to just survive we can thrive this is powerful you see instead of walking in fear and death and hell we walk in faith and in the confidence of everlasting life in him and now the only keys that you're supposed to be concerned about are the keys of the kingdom that Jesus gives us when we're born again now how we need to grab this Jesus has given us the keys to the kingdom now we take the keys, and whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth is loose in heaven. Let's talk about that binding thing. I'm talking about storming the gates of hell with authority in the name of Jesus. Romans 4, 17 says, Now we can call those things that be not as though they were. And when we do, let me tell you something, when we call it as God calls it, then all of heaven will back us up. We don't have to just talk about the promises of God. We can believe and receive the promises of God. Watch this. 2 Corinthians 1.20. For all, everybody say all. For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen. So be it unto the glory of God. And we have been given the keys of the kingdom, church. Those keys that will open the door to get what's in heaven, out of heaven and into the earth. Now listen to me, that is not cuckoo theology, that is biblical theology. Matthew 11 and 12 says, and I'm going to read it to you from a very clear translation. The kingdom of heaven has endured violent assault and violent men seize it by force as a precious prize. A share of the heavenly kingdom is sought with ardent zeal and intense exertion. Let me talk to you for a minute. When you begin to pray in the spirit, you begin to put some pressure on the kingdom of heaven. And one of the driving purposes of the Holy Spirit is to bring everything you need that's in heaven into the earth. Watch now. He gave us the keys to the kingdom. 
And one of those keys that has been dismissed in many Christian circles is this key of praying in the Spirit. Watch Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Now stop right there. It didn't say that we don't know what we should pray for. It says we don't know what we should pray for as we ought. Now this is very important. But the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Groanings that cannot be uttered. Stay with me for a moment. There are things that you just can't find words for in basic everyday language to adequately express what you need intercession it means to speak and articulate on another's behalf and what we need to understand both me and you we need to understand there are times in this life when you know what you need you just don't know what to pray you don't know how to pray for what you need and Romans tells us that's where the Holy Spirit comes in he intercedes for us making intense intercession for us watch this now he makes clarity out of our cloudy prayers and then he takes it deeper verse 27 says and he searcheth the hearts and knoweth what is in the mind of the spirit because he makes intercessions for the saints watch now where according to the will of God grab that when you are praying in the spirit the spirit connects with your spirit mind, not your soulful mind, the soul man, the seat of your will, your thoughts, your emotions, and your five senses. No, he connects with your spirit mind and not your soulful mind because the problem, listen to me, church, the problem is not your spirit mind. Your spirit wants to do the will of the Father, but your soulful mind wants to do for your flesh what your flesh desires. And sometimes, watch this this now because we don't know what to pray therefore we pray these prayers they sound spiritual to the natural man but they are really fleshy they're soul prayers but when you pray in the spirit the holy spirit bypasses your soul mind connects with your spirit mind and now your prayer lines up with the will of god let me talk to you church we pray some prayers that are beautiful Somebody says they're eloquent, but they are not aligning with the will of God. But when you begin to pray in the spirit, you can pray a shabby prayer and it'll touch the heart of God. You can sound like there's chaos in your prayer. But when you pray in the Spirit, see, that's why we're going to get some of y'all baptized in the Holy Ghost so you can begin to pray in the Spirit and quit sabotaging the will of God over your life because you're praying some prayer that sounds spiritual, but it's not. Spiritual prayers are not according to rhetoric. They're according to connection to the will of God. His kingdom coming, his will being done in every situation in the earth, no matter what it is, as it is in heaven. Number four, the Holy Spirit's driving purpose is to constantly deepen our relationship with the Father. Yes, indeed it is. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. 1 John 2, 27, but the anointing which ye have received of him that abideth in you, and you need not that any man should teach you, but as the same, um, same anointing teaches you all things, and is truth and is no lie, and even as it has taught you, you shall abide in him. Jesus said, now everybody stay with me, I'm going to really slow down on this one, because this one needs to hit you in the spirit. Jesus said that when the Holy, that the Holy Spirit will teach you everything you need to know. John says, you have an anointing in you talking about the Holy Spirit. And because he is in you, you don't have to have men teach you. Now let me help you before somebody under the sound of my voice goes diving into the deep end of the swimming pool of arrogance and saying, well, there you go. I don't need a pastor. I don't need a teacher. I don't need church. I can be a spiritual giant all by myself because I got the Holy Ghost. 
This is one of those scriptures that has been so misinterpreted and it has blown up more Christians into spiritually obese, arrogant Christians than any other scripture in the Bible. This is not what John was saying, for in Ephesians, the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 4 and 11, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and some teachers, what for? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God. Now stop right there. We need to understand something. This is an ongoing work, because none of us are at the same place spiritually in our growth in God so this will never stop and so what you need to understand is that you do need to be taught the word of God you need teachers and preachers and pastors to teach you the word of God so let's not get this twisted John wrote this for two reasons reason number one he was addressing Christians who were going to worldly entities in order to get answers to questions of spiritual matters listen church they were going to secular courts in order to resolve things that were spiritual matters. And John said to them, you don't need men to tell you how to deal with these issues. You have the Holy Spirit, the anointing of God in you, and he will lead you and guide you into all truth. He will give you all the wisdom that you need in all these matters of spiritual things. The second reason that he wrote it was this, that same Holy Spirit will help you understand what is being taught from the preacher's mind mouth. Let me put it another way. The same Holy Spirit will help you grow up. Now let me talk to you for a minute. There are some people who have been saved since Moses stood on Mount Sinai. But they're still as immature today as the first day the word of God was preached to them. And they go from conference to conference, crusade to crusade, revival to revival, and some from church to church, but they never mature. They are the same spiritual midgets they were when they first came to the Lord. And watch, in their immaturity, they think the problem is the preacher. They say silly things like, well, I'm not being fed anymore. The preacher is no longer anointing. Let's just have a come to Jesus moment. The truth of the matter, John says, is this. You don't need one more new teacher. You don't need one more new conference. You don't need to run to one more revival. You don't need one more new revelation. You don't need to go to another church. Listen to me. I hear people say all the time, God is telling me, I think God's telling me to leave this church or that church. Let me ask you a question and then let me make a statement. Why is it that a pastor in my 40 years and in my 30 years, as a, nearly 30 years as a senior pastor, I have yet for somebody to walk up to me and say, Bishop, the Holy Ghost told me don't leave my church. Why is it that people are always saying God told me when they're ready to exit the door? Let me talk to you for a minute. We need to really understand this. Here's the statement. Most of the time, God is not telling us to leave a church. Let me talk to you for a minute. Very rarely does God tell most Christians ever to leave a good, solid, Bible-preaching church. Listen to me. There are reasons in this Bible when it is right to leave a church. There are some reasons there, but none of those reasons qualify for leaving a church where the word of God is being preached, where the church is a healthy church. Now hear what I said. I didn't say it was a perfect church. I said it was a healthy church. Let me tell you something. Your body is not perfect, though it's healthy, because one day you're going to find out. Never mind. And the church body is the same way. So very rarely does God tell people to leave a solid Bible preaching church. Let me tell you what's happening when you start feeling like, oh, maybe I ought to move on. He is trying to tell you to move, but not a physical location, a spiritual location. Watch me now. Whenever God starts stirring us to spiritual growth, the first thing we try to do is discern it with our flesh. We start feeling antsy, feeling like we need to move on, that our time in that 
that place and a certain place is over and we don't understand is that this battle of the soul man and it is a battle between the spirit man. The soul man does not discern the things of the spirit. Thus when the spirit is trying to grow us and to mature us, the soul man is trying to confuse us and it says go instead of grow. Good God Almighty, I'm glad about three people helping me this morning. One couple came to our church, stayed a while, left. Came back, stayed a while, left. Moved out of state, moved back, came to church, walked up to me, said, God told me when you get back to Massachusetts and you get back to Boston, make sure you get back to Eagle Heights and you get there and you get planted and you stay there. You get under that anointing and they stayed under this anointing for two months and then they disappeared. Let me talk to you for a moment. That's called confusion. The Holy Spirit is not confused. And he does not confuse us. He does not send mixed messages. 1 Corinthians 14, God, I hope you're listening. God is not the author of confusion. Let me tell you something. And the devil is not always the author of confusion. Everybody say, sometimes it's the soul, man. God is stirring us to maturity. And what some of us need is a revelation of what you have on the inside of you. What you need is an awakening of the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God resident on the inside of you. Watch now, why? So that when the word is taught, you understand it, not with your head, but your spirit. Watch me now. You see, it doesn't matter who mounts this pulpit. I find that God always has a word to give me because I'm not trying to listen with my fleshly ears. I'm trying to connect with spirit ears. I'm trying to hear a word within the word. And let me tell you something, until you mature to that place, you will only receive from certain people. We sat in staff meeting on Wednesday and I let Jessica bring a short message because she came in my office and told me something God told her. It was a revelation to her, but it was a revelation we all needed to hear. From time to time, I will let the staff, I'll say, say, speak, because God doesn't only speak through me, he speaks through them as well. Let me talk to you for a minute. Stay with me now. The reason we can get to a place where we no longer receive from the preacher, I'm talking about one who is preaching and teaching the word of God. The reason we get to that place of an inability to receive no longer from him is that if we're not careful, our connection to him is in the flesh rather than in the spirit. And when his humanity shows up, and believe me, it will, because we are connected to him in the flesh rather than the spirit, the moment his humanity shows up, we can no longer receive from him. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, let me give you some advice. No, no man in the flesh. Now you're going to hear me repeat something several times during this message. On several occasions, you're going to hear me say this. If we need to receive anything from the Holy Spirit, it is discernment. What is discernment? It is the ability to see the truth in spite of what one is told. The ability to see the truth in spite of what one is told. It, the, the ability to see the truth in spite of what one is told. Let me turn another corner. With that said, God wants to speak to you. And the main way that he does it is through his word. Stay with me now. Through the reading, the studying, and the preaching, and the teaching of his word. Church, we have got to stop underestimating the power of the written word. And the power and the preaching and the teaching of that written word. God's word, listen to me church, God's word is the number one way that he communicates with us. Us. And the Holy Spirit is the person through which he communicates that word in such a way that it makes the 16 inch drop from our heads into our spirits, into our hearts. Now, let me throw this at you. Quit chasing prophets. Quit chasing every prophetic word. Let me talk to you today. While the prophetic gift is real, and God uses genuine prophets. Let me say two things. Number one, be careful because self-proclaimed prophets are a dime a dozen today. 
most of them claiming to be so, God did not call them. They called themselves. Now, let me help you know one of the surest signs that the prophet is truly of the Lord. Listen to me now. The surest sign that a prophet is really called by God is covering. Stay with me now. They are under covering. 1 Corinthians 14, 32 says, and the spirit of the prophets, prophets are subject to the prophets. The second prophet listened, listed there is translated pastor. Watch this now. 2 Chronicles 20 and 20. Believe the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets. That also translates pastors. Believe his pastors so that you shall profit. So you shall profit. See, here's, we prosper and here's our problem. We get into trouble when we exalt the word of a prophet prophet above the prophet who is called to be the pastor in our lives. Number one, you need to ask the first question. When somebody comes to you with a word from the Lord, your first question ought to be, and who is your pastor? I'm just trying to help. That's, that's all. I'm just trying to help. Number two, you and I must never raise the spoken word above the written word we must never raise the spoken word above the written word with that said though i want you to understand that god also speaks to us by the holy spirit in other ways now where we're about to go is important because there are those who believe in the holy spirit's existence and that he works in our lives they just don't believe that he speaks to us in any other way than through the bible I was reading two articles. One was titled, Please Stop Saying God Told Me. Another entitled, God Told Me? Really? Now listen to me closely. I am not going to go into their reasonings for why they believe that God does not speak to us other than by the Bible. And I am also not going to bash them the way they bash we who believe that God does speak to us outside of the Bible. But I'm going to say this one thing. The one article says that it accuses anyone who says God told me of using the phrase as a method of communication, communicating that way in order to make things interesting, suspenseful, and entertaining. It accuses us of using it to make ourselves sound more spiritual or of being preoccupied with mystical encounters and emotional ecstasies and seeking ongoing revelation from heaven. They say for the people who believe that God speaks to us, the Bible is simply not enough. Yet another claims that we no longer hear directly from God and to claim to do so is a clear violation of the third commandment to not take the Lord's name in vain. Let me say this from the start. I respectfully disagree with them because not all of us are trying to seek out some ongoing revelation from heaven. Not all of us, all we're trying to do is get what's in heaven to come into the earth. And not all of us are preoccupied with mystical encounters and emotional ecstasies. Not all of us use God told me to make our stories nor our lives more interesting, suspenseful, and entertaining. And yes, for most of us, God's word and the Bible is enough. And I know that there are people who do these things they're talking about. But what I've come to tell you today is this. While while God's word surely is enough. He does not limit his relationship and his communication with us solely to the written pages of the Bible. The Bible tells me in 1 Corinthians 2 and 9, but as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Verse 10 says, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit for the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. Now, watch this. The Bible is what is known as the Logos word. Logos means it is the written word of God. Now listen to me. The written word of God, the Bible, which is illuminated by the Holy Spirit, he brings us clarity and revelation to the word of God. That's why, though I grew up in a preacher's home, every time I open that book, something jumps out and I go, I didn't see that before. Well, was it not in there because I didn't see it? No, it was in there. But the Holy Spirit brought revelation and clarity. Then there is what is known as the rhema word. What is a rhema word? It is a spoken word. Now, why? 
watch this. It is a revelation word, and it is communicated by the Holy Spirit. Now listen to me closely. God does speak to us sometimes outside of the written word, but what he speaks outside of his written word, he will never violate his written word with it. It will be outside, but never outside of what you can back up with the word of God. And next week, Lord willing, we're going to begin to talk about some of the ways in which the Spirit of God communicates along with his word in our lives. And I'm going to tell you that every one of those ways you will find there is scripture to back it up. Now, let me just say this. I've made a statement in our church before that every time I say it, it's like, it seems like we don't grab it. But you need to grab this now. Grab this. A man with a testimony is never at the mercy of a critic. You need to grab that. I don't care what cemetery, I mean seminary they went to. I don't care how many PhDs, DDs, double Ds, triple Ds, BBDs they got hanging on their wall. You need to understand that a man with a testimony is never at the mercy of a critic. Let me give this, this short illustration. I was dating a girl when I was 17 years old. Now, now this, is going, this, this is a very simple illustration, but it's going to make my point. At the same time when I'm dating her, I am doing all I can to get closer to God. I'm 17 years old. I'm fasting and praying. And many times on Friday nights when all of my friends were out partying and I'd be at home on my knees before God at 12, 1, 2, 3 in the morning with my Bible open and I was praying and I didn't know any better. And I was fasting and I was seeking the Holy Spirit. And my brother, had kept te- he kept telling me that you need to understand, she's, I've seen her with other guys. And, you know, it, it, he's 17 years old. Big deal. But one day I'm sitting in my parents' living room. And I heard the voice of God inside of me come out of nowhere. Now pay attention to what I'm about to say. You know at 17, we know everything. At 17, I just knew I was going to marry her. And the Holy Spirit speaks to me, and he says, get in your car. I'm not making this up. He said, get in your car, begin to drive, and you are going to catch her with somebody else. I'm 17 years old. I get in my car, I drive around the corner, less than a quarter of a mile, and don't you know, I see a car coming toward me I had never seen before. I see her in the car, she ducks down in the seat, she thinks I didn't see her, and so I just drive on by. A little bit later, I go into my uncle's store, which by marriage was also her uncle. And there she is standing in the store, and she turns around, and she looks at me, and she smiles, and I said, where have you been? And she stormed out of the store, and she screamed, and she said, stay away from me. Why am I telling you that story? Follow me. I grew up in the church of God in Christ, and if any people believe in the power of the Holy Ghost, it is the church of God in Christ people. And we saw miracles in that little church that she and I both attended in Freeport, Illinois, because the people believed in the miracle working power of God that was wrought through the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Ghost. But stay with me. In those days in the church of God in Christ, there was a limited teaching on the Holy Spirit. All we were ever taught about the Holy Spirit was that when he comes over you, there will be an emotion that will come over you. The Holy Spirit will hit you, and when he would hit, we'd go to dancing and we'd go to shouting. And listen to me, church, most of our churches didn't have any air conditioning, and we'd be sweating, and we'd be shouting and dancing, and we'd be falling out in the floor. There was this one preacher, when the Spirit would hit him, his body would start acting like an eel. I mean, this dude, we'd all stop and go watching him. But let me tell you something. Once you went to dancing and shouting in the Holy Ghost, the people, the preachers, they would always say, oh, he's got it, she's got it. The emotion would get a hold of that person and the Holy Ghost would begin to move and they would say, he's got it or he's got you, whichever. But here's the point I want to make. Nobody told us that he was a person and he wants to lead us and to speak to us and to guide us into all truth and to direct our lives. And many of us lived holy 
on Sunday, but like hell, Monday through Saturday, because nobody told us that the Holy Spirit, yes, he will affect your emotions, but he will also affect your spirit. He will grow you and mature you in the things of God. Now, why is that important? Even in my ignorance, not knowing the Holy Spirit that way, I received a clear direction from the Holy Spirit. 17 years old, had no clue that the Holy Spirit would talk to me. Let me say it again. A man with a testimony is never at the mercy of a critic. God does speak to you through his word more than anything. But he speaks to you outside of that word too. If you are intimate with his spirit. Let me go as far as I can today to begin to talk about the properties of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian. What are the properties? They are the attributes, the characteristics found in the way the Holy Spirit operates in the life of a Christian who is yielded to him. Number one, the Holy Spirit provides insight. He enlightens. He provides insight. He enlightens. John 16 and 13 says, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. What does it mean to enlighten? Now, this is beautiful. It means wisdom to be freed from binding and blinding ignorance. Binding and blinding ignorance. Let me illustrate it this way. When Lady Brenda and I first started dating, I said, now, baby, if you're going to be with me, you're going to have to trade in those pants for a dress, and you're going to have to take off that war paint, no more makeup. Now, watch what happens. I'm looking at her one day. We're in college. And I said, God, why does she look so miserable? Listen, she wasn't unhappy. Her joy was being stolen. And listen to me. She loved me so much. She loved God so much. And she wanted to please me so much that she would do whatever it took to please me and God. And then suddenly I'm looking at her one day and I realized my responsibility to rightly divide the word of truth. And the Holy Spirit said, begin to seek me. Because I would see these women with no makeup on and no pants and they would be dressed up in these dresses and they looked more like they were wearing sackcloth than a dress. And we were taught that these things meant that you were holy. But as I watched Lady Brenda and I said, God, I know there are some things that do mean that we are holy and there are some things that we need to let go of, even if they're not sin, because we need to be different from the world. But I literally asked God, I said, God, what is it about this thing called makeup and pants that we're preaching in the church? Because most of the women I saw dressing the way the church said they ought to dress, let me tell you something, it didn't change their nature. They were still mean as an alley cat. And as I began to study the word of God and I sought the face of God, God began to enlighten me. He opened my eyes of my understanding and he spoke to me and he son, said, son, here's the problem. He says, Brenda is miserable because what you have been taught and what you have been trying to impose on her, that stuff is not biblical, it's cultural. And God began to show me that there was a lot that I was being taught. The people meant well, but those things were cultural and not biblical. And one of the properties of the Holy Spirit is that he provides insight and enlightenment. But let me say this, though, in defense of the church of God in Christ. They taught us to seek to be holy. There's a lot that they told us that was right back then. It's still right today. And if the church of Jesus Christ needs an enlightenment in any area today, it is what it means to truly be holy. Number two, the Holy Spirit provides discernment. That's guidance. 
Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led of the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. I'm going to say it one more time. If there's anything in one word that the body of Christ needs desperately, it needs to receive from the Holy Spirit discernment. What is it again? The ability to see the truth in spite of what one is told. The Holy Spirit is a burglar alarm like you have in your home. The other day, we've had our locks changed on our doors. And one of the locks, some of the locks, you just touch them and it'll automatically lock by itself. And I, I forgot about that and I shut the door and I hit the lock and all of a sudden the alarm starts going off. Now, I, I can't remember the code on the front door because it's new too. I can't get in the house and the alarm starts blaring all over the community and I was starting to have, oh, I was having nightmares. I could see Bishop handcuffed breaking into his own house. And, 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 and thank God, thank God the guy who installed the locks answered his phone and he reminded me of what the cold was. But let me tell you something, the Holy Spirit is like a burglar alarm in your home. When it goes off, you know somebody has come to your house that is uninvited. When the smoke detector goes off in your house, you know that something has gone awry. When a metal detector goes off in the airport, it makes a beeping sound that gives the, an alert to check things out. These alarms... Help us to know that something is not quite right. In the same way the Holy Spirit alarms the soul. Now let me tell you what I know. See, this is why I wish those who say God doesn't speak to us would stop saying that. Because I'm telling you that sometimes God does tell us. Let me illustrate it this way. Some of you will remember this story. And Jessica gave me permission to share this. A few years back, she was dating someone from another state. He had many issues in life that I'm not going to go into. But let me, t let me say this. That relationship was so dangerous that literally I set out to fast and pray for three days. I made God a promise I'm not going to eat, I'm not going to drink anything until I hear from you. I did not know that Lady Brenda was doing the same thing. On the third day of the fast, at the end of the day, we both look at each other, not knowing that the other one is fasting, and literally, simultaneously, we said, you're ready to eat? Now watch this. God told me it's settled, it's done. But watch what happens. Because I was frustrated. I couldn't make her do anything. I was like, I, I was so, let me see. I was ready to get in the car and drive to that place with a baseball bat. And God said, you can't do that. But here's what happened. I said, God, if, she's, if, it's gonna, if this is gonna break, you gotta show her. And so one weekend she comes to her mother and she says, I'm gonna go down to Rhode Island and stay with a friend for a while. What we did not know was she was actually getting in her car with a couple of guys from this church and she was going down because watch what I'm about to say. God spoke to her spirit and said, Drive to Pennsylvania and don't say anything. She gets in the car, she drives down there, walks up to the apartment, which most of all she had been taking care of, takes the key that she has to the door, walks in and catches him in the bed with another woman. Don't tell me that God does not talk to us. God speaks to your spirit. Number three, the Holy Spirit provides wisdom and revelation. Ephesians 1, 17 through 20, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of the calling, what are the riches of the glory of the inheritance of the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of the power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him in heavenly places. Let me illustrate this one this way. A few days ago, I went to my wife as we were getting ready to come into the office. And I said, babe, God just told me to go and tell one of our, our staff pastors a certain thing. And as I'm out praying on my way to work, God says, don't hesitate. Today, when you get in the office, the first thing I want you to do is tell him what I told you. So I sit in my office, I buzz him on the phone, and I bring in one of our staff pastors, and I sit him down, and I looked at him, and I could tell he was going, what did I do? And I looked at him, and I said, God told me to tell you. 
And I told him the things that God told me to tell him. And he started weeping like a baby. And he said, Bishop, you don't understand that I needed this this very moment because I was just in my office praying about the exact same thing you said to me. You don't know how my spirit needed to be lifted. Don't tell me that God does not talk to us. Number four, the Holy Spirit provides conviction and correction. John 16, 8 through 11, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin because they do not know me of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more and of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. God's Spirit continually is moving to convict men that they are sinners, but let me tell you what else he does. He is constantly moving to convict God's children when we are perpetuating sin. According to Lisa Belcher Hamilton, Fred Rogers of the famous show known as Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, he took courses on how to preach during his time in seminary. And Mr. Rogers himself tells this story of himself. He said, years ago, my wife and I were worshiping in a little church with friends of ours. They were on vacation, and he was in the middle of his homiletics course at that time. In short, homiletics is a course where they teach you how to preach. And he is sitting in this small church, and during the sermon, he kept ticking off every mistake that he thought the preacher, who must have been so 80 years of age, he kept ticking off every mistake he thought that old preacher was making. He said when the interminable sermon finally ended, he turned to one of his friends intending to say something critical about the sermon, but watch this. As he turned to make his snide remark, he saw that which stopped him in his tracks. He saw tears streaming down the face of his friend as she whispered to him, he said exactly what I needed to hear. Mr. Rogers said, that was really a seminal experience for me. I was judging and she needing, and the Holy Spirit responded to the need, not to my judgment. Do you see it? One moment's time, the Holy Spirit of God brought conviction and correction at the same time. I'm going to have to wrap here, but let me close by saying this. In 1856, Henry Brown, a slave from Richmond, Virginia, decided he didn't want to be a slave anymore. Henry Brown went out and found himself a box, a small wooden crate, and he postmarked it to an abolitionist in Philadelphia, which was a free territory. Henry Brown got inside that box, sealed the box from the inside, and mailed himself to Philadelphia. <laughs> Henry Brown was banking on the U.S. Postal Service to deliver him. He was in slavery. He needed to be delivered. The abolitionist got the crate. When he opened the box, Henry Brown stood up after being in that box for three weeks and said, how do you do, sir? My name is Henry Brown, and I was a slave, and I heard about you being an abolitionist, so I'm entrusting my future to you. I said that to say that was a risk. It was an oxygen risk, a risk of being discovered, and a risk of being hungry. But when Henry Brown stood up in Philadelphia, he was a free man. Henry Brown rejoiced because the risk was well worth the inconvenience. I said that to say this, especially in the time we're living in. Sometimes living a committed Christian life surely involves risk. It involves having faith that Jesus is going to come through for us. But I'm telling you that before this day is over, before our days on earth are over, we're all going to find out that living this committed Christian life is and was a risk that is and was well worth the inconvenience. Amen. And we have a promise, a promise of the Holy Spirit who will keep us, carry us, direct us, guide us. And Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
And his disciples looked at him and said, hold on a second. You're telling us you're leaving us, but now you're not going to leave us. They missed it. He said, in a little while, you're not going to see me anymore but, anymore, but then in a little while, you'll see me again. And he said, there's so many things I'm trying to tell you, but right now you can't understand them. What they didn't understand was that Jesus had to leave them so he could come back to them in a way that he would no longer be with them only, but in them. Here's what's powerful about it. They had to go through it so we could get to it. Mm. Here's the revelation. He no longer walks before us he walks with us. He is in us. Emmanuel, God with us. Woo, glory. I feel some anointing here. I feel some anointing here. So wherever you are right now in your life, just believe and just do as this simple preacher does every morning. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me. Shape me after your will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Would you do that just for a moment where you are? Right where you're seated. Say, welcome, Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Can we put our hands together? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My God. Well, blessings, Eagle Heights family. Thank you for joining us today. It's time to worship the Lord with his tithes and our offerings. Amen. Our special offering this week is for the Joe S. Chess Fund. And, and your generous seed offering towards the Joe, H, the Joe S. Chess Fund will it'll help pay for the additional cost of just over $13,000 to cover the extended area of that parking lot with gravel. Our aim is to install the new asphalt after the winter months are gone, uh, which is our next renovation phase. So please keep sewing towards the parking lot repair. I want you to mark your calendars also, church, uh, for Sunday, November 15th. Just mark your calendar because that's our Bishop Appreciation Day. And I know that the word from this pulpit by Bishop Collins has been a blessing to the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So let's be prepared to honor God's servant with a special love offering. In the beginning of the message, Jessica mentioned that every year the hands full of rice is what we give to help families in need so that they can have a blessed Thanksgiving. So in the next few weeks, we can give towards the handful of rice. To, and also, listen, make sure that you indicate as you give in your envelopes or online, make sure that you indicate the ministries that you're sowing in. As you prepare here and even at home, there's a teenager named Chris who pondered on the goodness of God. And then he wrote these short words. He said, when I look at all the ways that God has blessed me, God gives me a great, amazing, he gives me great, amazing gifts all the time. And I hardly ever remember to say thank you. If I pay more attention to praising God and less attention to my problems, by a lot, I'll be a more joyful person. Amen? A lesson in life that life will teach us is that a thankful heart is always a giving heart. 
if you struggle to give your tithe or to sow into the kingdom of God, let me help you. Let me help you by, by asking you to answer this question. Why should I be thankful? And so let me help us this morning. God woke me up today. Can somebody say that? Listen, God has given me health. God has given me shelter. God is my provider. God is my refuge. God is my strong tower. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. God keeps my children. God raises a standard against my enemies. God gives us peace. God is a living hope that lives in me. Today, as we give God the tithe and we sow our seed offering, just say thank you. Just say thank you. Knowing that every time, listen, everything, everything comes from him. Here's what the word says, and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Father, we give you praise, glory, and honor. God, what a powerful word. And Father, we surrender. We surrender, Father, to the voice of the prophet of the angel of this house. There's been a shift and you're changing us and you're transforming our lives. And I'm praying, Father, that there's clear revelation and understanding and the things that hinder you get them out the way. And Father, even when we sow and we give our tithe, that's worship. And it's an acknowledgement, dear God, that we don't own ourselves and that we have, Father, what we have is because you've given it. And so, Father God, humbly we thank you because there's a privilege when we can give because you brought it to our hand. So, Father, we give you glory, honor, and praise in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes. Go on and give him glory. Give him glory. Give him glory. I shared with my wife, I said, I don't know how anyone who knows him could ever walk away from him. I don't know. Life can be beautiful, but it can be sometimes such a battle. And I would never want to be in this battle in my own might and in my own power. And I want to be in this battle with my helper with my helper because I need you oh I need you every hour I need you you're my one defense my right just mess Oh, God, how I need you. Throw your hands toward heaven and say, oh, I need you. Yes. Oh, I need you. Yes, every hour I need you. Yeah, you're my one. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. I heard one preacher say, I wouldn't make a move without the Holy Ghost. He simplified it and said, I wouldn't step in my shower without first inviting the Holy Ghost. I wouldn't slip on my clothes. I wouldn't eat my breakfast. I wouldn't walk out my door without the Holy Ghost. You know what that tells me? The moment your physical eyes pop open, let your spiritual eyes pop open and tell him today, tell him that moment. Oh, I need you. Oh, I need you. 
your heart and your hands. Oh, how we love you. Oh, how we praise you. Oh, how we worship. Oh, Lord. Now the Bible says the true testament of praise is to bring him a sacrifice of praise. What is a sacrifice? It's when you don't actually possess something. But you give what you've got. Some of us are at a place where within ourselves we're empty. We don't have enough. We've been through enough. We've done enough. And we're like David. We're at the end of ourselves. So now we bring a sacrifice of praise. We lift our hands in spite of our pain. We lift our voice in spite of our pain. We release the anointing and the spirit in spite of our pain. And we tell God today, we tell him today, we tell him in spite of it all, I want you to know, I want you to know. Oh, how we love you. Come on, church. Oh, how we Say, oh, how we love you, and oh, how we praise you, oh, how we worship. Now, why do we do it? Oh, Lord, here's why we do it. For our hearts cry, be magnified in this your holy temple in this your holy place so we will rise to Zion's height come on y'all to praise and glorify cause we're unified say oh how we love you oh how we
now may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Eagle Heights Cathedral, it's been a pleasure to worship with you once again. I want to take a moment to remind you that you can help us provide meals for families in need this Thanksgiving by giving into the hands full of rice. To learn more about us and to register for service in person next week, visit us at ehconline.org. We look forward to seeing you soon.